Okay, so today we are going to uh, start a new topic. Um, last time we did, uh, uh, you know, circuits related to diodes. Couple of you came to me with questions, and we will sort those questions out on one on one. So we are going to talk about bipolar junction transistors, BJT. So um, when we looked at PN junction diodes, it was a two terminal device. And we saw that uh, the current flows only in one direction, uh, depending upon the biasing of the diode. If it's in forward bias or reverse bias, according to that, it will uh, the current will flow, right? Okay, so in some cases it's useful. Uh, however, you know, we want something that uh, where you have something to control, a terminal to control um, the current flow between two uh, two other terminals, right? So the three terminal devices are extremely useful. And uh, this kind of comes from the vacuum tubes. Um, you know, originally in the vacuum tubes, what you had was, uh, you know, you had a filament uh, which would heat up uh, the electrode and which will start emitting electrons. And there would be uh, a, a uh, another electrode sitting which is, uh, which is attracting those electrons. And behind that electrode is the final plate uh, which will, um, you know, so the current will start flowing between the plate and the, the from the filament. So, um, uh, you know, till uh, till that time, about 1950s or so, vacuum tubes were used. I mean, I have used a vacuum tube radio at my home. I had a vacuum tube radio, and if you open it up, it's really fun to watch. It has lots of these glass, cute glass uh, tubes, um, along with, and when you turn it on, you know, you see uh, glowing red light which is the, the heater, actually electric heater for each transistor, um, okay? So, however, that's too big. So, you can have only certain number of, uh, you know, vacuum tubes and it's not really practical for large scale integration. So, when the bipolar devices came into picture, um, that was, uh, that, that really changed the, uh, changed the picture, you know? Uh, because you could really uh, make them small, the device is very small and you could put many, many of them together uh, to get a very good functionality. Okay, so we, uh, by BJT is a three terminal device. And the goal is to control the current between the two, okay. So there is a current flowing between the two, two uh, terminal using a third terminal, okay. So this is our control and this is the current flowing from one to another. And this was invented in 1947 uh, at Bell Labs. Uh, by Shockley, uh, Bardeen, and Bretain, okay, and they also got a nine, uh, Nobel Prize, 1956. Um, so from 50 to 75, uh, 1950 to 75, BJTs were the king. Uh, they pretty much ruled um, all the all the circuits uh, which were being done, um, and they were pretty much replacement for vacuum tubes, which were large and bulky. Uh, so they led to miniaturization of electronics and you know kind of explosive growth in electronics. Uh, that's what happened during uh, using BJTs. However, after 75 or so, MOSFETs came into picture, which we're going to learn later. You know, metal um, metal oxide semiconductor uh, transistors, uh, field effect transistors. So uh, that will be our next thing. Uh, but before we get there, let's uh, study BJTs because BJTs is kind of a natural extension from PN junction that you just learned. Now, um, when I'm teaching you BJTs, I'm not going to go through the classic devices type of uh, thing. Intention is to give you something that will remember forever. Okay, that's my intention. So that if somebody wakes you up at night, you should be able to tell how the BJT works in the simplest possible fashion. Okay, so pay attention. I mean, okay, if you miss it, it's okay. Then you'll have to just remember the equations. That's about it. Okay. If you look at BJT, uh, it's pretty much like a combo of two diodes. Okay. So let's start from that. So you have a N diode, uh, let's call one diode here. This is N and P, okay? So that would be one diode. And um, the second diode will be P and N, okay? So these are the two diodes and we connect them together and then we uh, we have this, uh, this terminal, right? So this is, a, Again, I'm exaggerating things to make a point, okay? And slowly we will get to the real device. So, um, obviously you can uh, then uh, do this. You can take a diode which looks like this. You can combine the P-type because it's the same. So you have N, P, and N, 
okay and the device is this is called collector okay this is emitter and this is our base in between okay so this is uh, what it looks like you have two diodes and you have another one that looks like this okay so we took two separate diodes and we kind of conceptually put them together and that's the way the bjt looks like now this has very unique properties which we're going to see uh, slowly now the uh, the trick here is the following the emitter doping is the highest doping everybody knows what doping is right huh? so in emitter what kind of doping would you be doing if it's n type Donor or acceptor? Donor. So the ND here, which is, so it's a heavy doping. You take a piece of silicon and you heavily dope it. And that's your N plus region. Okay. So this is more looking like an N plus. The plus signifies heavy doping. Okay. The, the base P is lighter doping, relatively lighter doping compared to this. And P type means what kind of doping? Acceptor. Okay. So this is acceptor. Uh, doping that will be like a boron and heavy doping will be like phosphorus okay so this is uh, light doping compared to this and the last one collector has the lightest doping okay conceptually that's what it is all right so um, when you draw this device it looks like this this is the way you signify and we are drawing NPN transistor. Later on, I'm going to show you what a PNP looks like also, right? So this is our collector. This is base and this is emitter. And this is your NPN BJT. Similarly, we have PNP BJT. We'll come to that later. Okay. Now, this is kind of a distorted picture just to make a point. But in reality, when you actually uh, implement the device on a chip, on a silicon, if you remember that wafer that I showed you, you will implement this on a wafer. So how does it look like? So this is the way it looks like. Okay, if I take a, um, let's say use different colors. Uh, so here is your, um, okay, let's use this color for the, we are looking at the device from the top. All right, so this is our emitter and this would be N plus. So you will have lots of, uh, you know, heavy doping here. Understand? That rectangle. Then we will have uh, the next one would be uh, P, which is a little bit lighter. And this would be uh, P doping. So it's a little bit lighter. It's lighter doping. And the last one is collector, which is N minus. So this would be your N minus, and as I'm showing you, it's lightest doping. All this doping business will make sense fairly soon, okay? But just keep that in mind what's going on. It's all intentional. So this is the, the way we look at the device from the top once it's manufactured, all right? So when you're making the device, first you do the collector, and then inside the collector you would do the base region, and then inside the base, you'll do the emitter region. And you will start increasing the doping concentration as you go up. Okay, that's what you would do. Now, if I take a cross section of this device right here, right here, this is the way it's going to look like. Do you understand what a cross section? We're looking at it from the top and we're going to slice it, and then we're looking at the sandwich, how it looks like. Right? So the first you will see. Um, I'm exaggerating a little bit. This would be your N plus. All right. And the base would look like this. Okay. So this would be our uh, P. And the last one is again N plus, which would look like this.
something like that. This would be your n minus, all right. So having just a device like this is not useful. You have to connect to all these electrodes. So then you use metallization and let's use metal using this color. Right now for sake of simplicity, let's just keep one connection, okay. In this particular one, I'm not showing the metals because it will obstruct all the views, okay. So this would be my emitter, this would be my base and this would be my collector, okay. So these are metal contacts. Okay. So, do you notice something peculiar here? Can you comment on the base region? It's extremely thin. Okay. Just keep that in mind. The base region is extremely thin intentionally. Whereas, if you look at the collector thickness, it's pretty, uh, pretty thick collector. You know, in terms of thickness means this, this part. Okay. All right. So now let's see um, um, how this thing works, right? Can I move on? Are you, are you okay? Any questions on this so far? Okay. So uh, there are three modes of BJT operation. Okay. So let me draw your... Um, I'm intentionally drawing it this way to make a point, even though you wouldn't draw it this way. Collector, base and emitter, all right. So there are three modes, one of them is called cutoff, all right. In the cutoff mode, Base to collector junction is reverse biased and as well as base to emitter junction, that's also reverse bias. Everybody understand what reverse bias is, right? Hmm? If you apply positive to the positive terminal of a diode, then it indicates forward bias. So in this particular case, you know, there are only so many combinations of voltages that you can apply. Uh, so in the cutoff region, both the diodes are in the reverse bias. And then there is a forward active or active mode which is in this case uh, base to collector junction stays reverse bias, okay. However, base to emitter junction is forward bias. Okay. And the last one is saturation and in this case it's both forward. All right. And then I will also draw the, this would be our, uh, this is the PNP, uh, sorry, NPN and this would be PNP. Collector, base and, these are just definitions, okay. And now we will observe the VJT in different, different sections what happens. In the cutoff region, obviously, it's not very useful. Both the diodes are off and nothing is going on. The device is not even in the circuit, okay, in that sense. All right. So the most interesting portion is right here, okay, the active, active, um, active region when the BJT is. So we'll start with that and then we will, uh, we will get into saturation region. All right. So uh, before we jump into the, uh, the active region, right, uh, maybe I could uh, do this on the board so that it, it makes a lot more sense, okay? Allow me to do that. So uh, we will start with just a PN junction diode. PN junction everybody is familiar with, right? So let's start with the PN junction. The reason I'm doing it on the board is so that we can draw everything at the same place and then we can compare. So let's say we start with the PN junction and I'm intentionally drawing it this way. This is the other junction, okay? So this is uh, P and N, N is N plus intentionally, P is lightly doped, all right. And now if I apply I'm applying a positive voltage 
So this is our base and emitter. We are only looking at one uh, one 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 junction diode. Okay, so between base and emitter, I'm I'm connecting plus minus. So this is my VB. Is this clear so far? Okay. Now um, something interesting that I would like to do in terms of representation, which, which you probably haven't seen anywhere else, is the following. Okay. So this. Look at this as an axis, the horizontal, then it will be clear. So this is high and this is low, you know, horizontal axis, because then I can draw things, uh, carrier concentration. So when you apply positive over here and negative over here, what happens? We learned that in the PN junction, right? Hmm? Somebody, you have reviewed this. Which, which carriers go where? Somebody stand, like uh, raise your hand. It's okay, even if it's you, you get it wrong, it's all right. So, um, what, how is the carrier transport happening in the PN junction? That's my question. If I apply positive forward bias. Okay, good enough answer. So, what he said is that, what's the dominating uh, carrier here in N plus? Lots of them. Electrons, right? So they will, what will they do? What's the, ha, huh, diffuse. You remember that perfume or the, the ink example, right? And they will diffuse from here over here, okay? So you will have, let's say this is some carrier concentration and you will have uh, the concentration of electrons will look like this, something like this, okay? It's an exponential, if, if you look at this as x, if you go up like this, and this, this horizontal axis as the level of carrier concentration, low being here and high being over here. This is what you would see. So N plus, you have electrons, very high concentration of electrons. That's like our ink from one side, and there is a light, um, very light um, doping over here. Electrons will diffuse to the other side, all right? And then they will start diffusing like this with an exponential relationship. All right, so the rate, the slope of this curve will give you the current, the diffusion current, all right. So as soon as these electrons enter the P region, what do they become? They become minority carriers. So it's the minority carriers in the P region that will give you current. So this is the way the electrons current flow, correct? And what about our holes, which are in the P region? They will also diffuse. Hmm? over here. But however, their concentration will be a lot lower because it's PD. It's like lightly doped compared to this. So that, that will look like this. Okay, this is the whole concentration. I'm calling H plus. Is this part clear so far? Because this is critical to understanding what's going on. All right. So you will have some electron current flowing like this. Whole current will flow like this. And for all practical purposes, since we are doing N plus, we can ignore this part because, just because of the ratios of the, uh, the two. So we can say that the carrier, the current is flowing mainly due to the electrons. So far you are with me? All right. So the, if the electrons are flowing this way, then the current will flow which way? Opposite direction. So the current will flow in this direction. Okay. So this is our I. Just call it I for now. Everybody is with me so far? Because now is the next step. Any questions on this? Okay, all right. So now what we do is we bring in the third electrode. That's called collector. And when we are bringing in the third electrode, what are we doing? We're saying that okay, and I'm intentionally keeping this really thin. Okay, if you remember, the width of the base region was thin, ultra thin, and then the collector was wide, big really large. Of course, emitter was also thin, but it doesn't matter for our discussion right now. All right, so this is our N plus, and this is our P, and this is N minus. And we have a connection here going, and since it's forward active region, where is the base to, uh, base to collector junction? First of all, this is forward biased. Okay, so this is VBE, 
it's forward bias. Okay, P is connected to positive, N is connected to negative. Okay, and I'm going to reverse bias this. That's the way we define. So in the reverse bias, how would you connect it? N will be connected to positive. So you will see something that looks like this, like this. Okay, so this is our V. PC. Okay. Is this clear? What did I do? I showed you this. I showed you the carrier transport and now I said that I'm going to bring in this collector. This is called collector. Which has N minus. Ulti ultimately lightly doped. This is lightly doped and this is very heavily doped. Emitter. Okay. So this is our emitter. And this is the base region. And property of the base region is ultra thin. Okay, now what will happen? Same action will happen, continue to happen here. Correct? All right. However, I made this really thin. Okay. So, can this continue like this? Will it? It will not. What happens is at this junction, there is a reverse bias. Okay, so reverse bias brings what? Depletion region, if you remember when the diode is reverse biased. So then you will have some kind of depletion region around it. This is the depletion region. And what does depletion region by definition mean? zero carriers, right? So here we had this nice profile, whereas over here at this point you will have pretty much zero concentration of the carriers. And here you will have a large carrier concentration. So you will have something like a straight line going down in terms of the, the, the minority carrier concentration in base. Now this still might be a little bit confusing, but bear with me for a minute. So now what do I have is I have this, this concentration used to be like this, now it's became like a really steep impulse type of structure, okay? And now, so there will be a large current which will flow because suddenly the, the, the slope of this curve has become pretty large. And why did it become large? Because of this width as well as the depletion region, okay? And the current, electron current will start flowing this way. We expect it to continue flow this way. However, as soon as it, since the, the connection is on the side, as soon as it goes somewhere in that area, what happens? It gets attracted by the positive voltage at the collector, okay? So think about it this way. Um, there are a whole bunch of rats on one side, okay? And we created this mesh of cheese, you know, which is kind of mesh meaning you can go through it. So the, let's, let's assume that the perfume of the cheese on that mesh will attract more rats. In our case, it's their electrons, right? So if I increase the concentration on that, of, of the cheese perfume on the mesh, they will, they will try to hit the, the mesh. However, just behind the mesh, there is even a bigger piece of cheese, which is our collector, right? Because we are applying this voltage. So some of the rats will go through the, you know, they will get, get stuck with the mesh. But most of them, dominating them, will go through the mesh and they will hit the collector. It's kind of exactly what is going on over here. Is that clear? So imagine all these electrons, they need to go to this side and they need to complete the circuit here. But there, there comes the collector, which has a very strong positive voltage with the depletion region. So the electrons kind of get confused. I'm kind of exaggerating this to make a point, uh, and they just hit the collector, all right? So most of the electrons which are coming, the minority carrier concentrations inside that, that thin uh, base region will hit the collector, and the current will flow through, straight through the collector, okay? That's exactly what happens. And the point is also, if you re reduce this width of the base region, Okay, if you keep it large, then few electrons will go to the collector. But if you reduce that 
or make that width thinner, more electrons will go on the other side. Okay? Does that make sense? The other thing that will increase this current will be the ratio of these concentrations. So if this is heavier than this, so this N plus will have ND and this will have NA acceptor, right? So if you increase the ratio of ND versus NA, so if you make it higher and higher and higher doping compared to this one, then you can, you get more and more current. So that's the insight that I would like you to remember. What is the insight? Thinner the base region, higher the current going to the collector. Okay? Because the electrons don't have time to think. They will just run through the mesh in between. The purpose of the base is to get the electrons excited and cross the boundary. Okay? And then the collector is there to really take care of them. All right. So this is kind of a very high level description of how the BJT works. So we have a control gate here, controlling element, this is base. And we, we make this positively charged, I mean uh, we forward bias base to emitter junction, but the collector base junction is reverse biased, all right, like this way. And the electrons will come here and they'll go. So the, there'll be some current due to the holes, but it's, it will be, it will be small for the purpose of our discussion, for you know, understanding. But to complete the thought, you can add them also in there and eventually then you'll ignore them because of the, the concentrations. But this is kind of the basic phenomenon that's happening inside the bipolar, all right? And we will compare this to MOSFET. Um, there also we are fooling the electrons, you know, to come out there and join the party. And then they, we move their cheese to the collector or the drain in this case, all right? Okay, so let's go back to our uh, equations now. Keep this in mind, what's exa exactly going on. The key thing to remember about bipolar action is this part. We reduce the size of the base, and then we have this slope, which will cause the current to flow. Yeah, how the? Yeah, so if I, if I increase this VBE, right, then more and more current will flow. And then, then it will flow over here. Okay, so pretty much the current which is going from uh, emitter or, or I mean the reverse way, the current is going reverse way, the electrons which are flowing from emitter to collector, they follow the, re, uh, the same equation of, of your, uh, they'll follow the same equation which is Is exponential VBE divided by Vt. Okay, so this would be your IC. But the interesting part is it's a collector current and it's function of base to emitter voltage. Okay, that's the interesting part. So you are controlling a collector current which is flowing from here over here between these two using just the base to emitter voltage. Okay, so let's uh, go back to the little more equations. So the current I will be equal to approximately Is exponential VBE or Vt and this is your collector current IC. The same effect and this Is is a uh, function of your uh, Is is equal to uh, area of the emitter. Of course, if you increase the area, you will have more current and then uh, Q D and P by dx. It's diffusion current, so it matters what's the rate of change of carriers, okay, derivative with respect to this distance, okay, and that is given by, uh, uh, again, you know, if you remember the, at this point it will be your NPO, and at this point it will be zero, and this is your base width W. I'm only drawing the base region right now. Okay, so deep DNP divided by DX is given by um, NPO divided by W. Okay, so we can write this equation again. I'll go over this again one more time. Q times, and what's NPO is NI square divided by N of A, acceptor concentration, W. So W being the width of that uh, base region, and this is the concentration of the, of the minority carriers inside base. 
okay so this gives us an insight which again uh, which i already gave you a e uh, q n i square divided by w n a ha ha so when we were doing the pn junction then the diffusion constant comes into picture what does diffusion constant mean it has a property of how the thing diffuses through there right so there is a diffusion constant and diffusion length and that we use it to create an approximate slope in this particular case that's not necessary in this case it's like a straight line right you will have maximum concentration on uh, on the on the interface and on the other side there is a depletion region so there is zero concentration virtually yeah so this particular expression is rate of change okay in the base region so rate of change let me magnify this so it will be clear so this was our base region so this is a base region right so what we said is um uh, at this particular point and at this particular point what is the concentration at this particular co point the concentration will be since it's a it's a it's a p type you know what's the maximum concentration you can have is n i square divided by n of a that would be the concentration and out here what is the concentration zero right so then we can draw a straight line here pretty much okay and the slope of this straight line is what will decide your um, you know flow of electrons right so that slope is what we are calculating here dnp by dx and that will be equal to n i square um, uh, divided by n a divided by w okay um, again you know more than the equation uh, the insights are important right now what are the insights here huh? first is the current will increase as you increase the area of the emitter if you make it bigger bigger that will happen and um, the n i square is dependent on temperature so you will have the same temperature dependence the w is the width of the base region so if i make the width of the base region thinner 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 my current will increase okay and what is na na is the doping inside the base region if i make that lighter 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 then i'll get more uh, more current okay so that's the observation now so so far we only talked about the collector current okay what about the base current what's going on in the base uh, earlier that entire current would have flown through the base right without the collector brought into picture that's what we showed however because of the collector we kind of fool the electrons to just jump uh, to the collector rather than going to base so however there is some small amount of current which is going to flow through the base and there will be two components ib1 and ib2 so ib1 is basically the holes diffusing in emitter which is that other portion uh, you know which we ignore so this will be also proportional to e to the power v b e by v t okay and the second part of the current will be i b2 which is uh, there will be holes which will be recombining in base region with electrons okay and this is also proportional to the e to the power v b e by v t okay because if you increase the e to the power v b by v t then more uh, you will have more electrons uh, will be available in the in the base region so you will have more base current okay so let's summarize everything what what i have explained so far and the summary is you will have a uh, you'll have current let me make one point and then i will put the summary through for you okay so base current is given by ib is given by ic divided by beta okay so base current is very small and beta is uh, like a current gain um, and as we can see the beta will uh, go up Hmm. if width of the base will go down and beta will also go up if number of donor versus na concentration also goes up same thing um, you know we just we just did here so how heavily the emitter is uh, though this is base current and then the emitter current i'm going to put it all together in a summary just in a second okay emitter current will be ie 
that will be equal to IC plus IB and that will be IC plus uh, IC divided by beta and that will be beta plus 1 divided by beta times IC. So, since beta is large, you now this number is approximately 1 and uh, generally it is defined alpha is beta divided by beta plus 1. All these names will make sense in a short Right now, just look at it as notation. I will say IE is IC divided by alpha. So, um, this is given as IS divided by alpha exponential PB by OT. So, beta is your current gain and alpha is uh, approximately equal to 1. Okay. So, now um, I just kind of described the phenomenon to you, uh, what happens, uh, let us uh, summarize again. The collector current depends on what? How forward biased the base to emitter junction is, right. We are talking about forward active region and um, the base current will depend on the recombination which is happening inside the base region and also the whole current. Uh, inside your uh, inside the emitter emitter side okay so and the base current is very small so we are injecting in a way base is like a input and collector is the collector current is the output in a way so small amount of base current change will give you large amount of collector current variation and that's where you get the current gain which is better okay so we can model this um, and again here this is called large signal equivalent model for NPN. So, we can model it as follows. I will explain how this we can um, consolidate this. So, here is our base and he, here is our collector and here is our emitter, okay. So, we are applying VBE and then you will have collector current which is IS exponential VBE divided by VT, correct. Whatever we have learned so far, I am just plugging it in here. Applying VBE will give you collector current which looks like this, okay. And so, here is a current which is flowing through uh, the emitter which is IE, this is our IC and this is our IB. The emitter current is going to be ISE exponential PVE by VT, okay. So, this ISE basically is uh, IS divided by alpha. What happens is this current and uh, basically IC plus IB is going together, so you will have plus 1 factor, okay. Earlier you had just beta, now you have beta plus 1. So, um, if we write the expression, it would, uh, you know, it would come out to be this basically, beta divided by beta plus 1, alright. And the other familiar large signal model, uh, this would be easier to even digest, is as simple. Uh, note the no electrodes, this is our collector and this is our base and this is the emitter, okay. So, we are applying VBE over here and that will cause current IB to flow through here and what is the, the current which is going to flow through here? First of all, what is the current on the from collector to uh, emitter? That would be IS exponential VBE divided by Vt, that would be the current flowing. So, if the VBE goes up, the collector to emitter current will go, go up, okay. And the, the current which is flowing through this diode, the base uh, emitter diode will be, um, here in this model will be equal to ISB which will be IS divided by beta. So, you can see the IB 
gets multiplied by beta from here over here. Okay, that's the model that we are trying to create. And all this is valid only when VB has to be in which region? Forward bias. And V uh, collector base junction should be reverse bias. Okay, and that's what is called active region. And um, uh, so the insights again, uh, going back to insights, changing the base voltage, okay, VBE, if you increase that base voltage, then the collector current will increase exponentially, which is what is modeled over here in this case, IS exponential VBE by VT, okay. And that's the key thing we are trying to get, get at, is we would like to change the base voltage and then we will have a large variation in the, in the collector current. And the flip of that you can also do is you have base current which is getting multiplied by beta, okay. I mean they are all fitting into the same equations uh, for our convenience. And this is a large signal model, so when you are doing the small signal model we are going to deal with it separately. But this is just a large signal model. So this is like exact uh, description of your bipolar. You are biasing the bipolar device then you can use any of these models uh, to figure out what is my base current, what is my collector current, everything, okay. Uh, the next thing we have is, uh, any questions on this so far? Yeah, please, yeah. Uh, this is only valid when the device is in forward active region or active region. Does it not depend on the? No, we are, right now uh, there is, uh, we are not treating any terminal, right? This is not yet an amplifier. We have not designed an amplifier. We are only looking at the device. We are going to come to that. I know where you where you are going with this. This is a little bit ahead, about three four lectures ahead. What he is talking about, uh, Abhilaksh, right? Is something common. We are not doing that yet. Right now, we are just looking at the naked device, okay? And then we are saying, if I do it, if I move the base here, what happens? Base voltage here, okay? So think about it that way. No, it's not. I mean, I'm not looking at it like an amplifier right now. Okay, you're just be patient a little bit because we're going to get to the common base, common emitter amplifier, all those things and that then it will make more sense. Right now, all we're doing is we're taking the device and we're just looking, trying to understand the device, what happens if I change the base to emitter voltage and then uh, there was some question here also, please. Why is the? Okay, so if you remember, right, in the last signal case, I mean, I'll give you the example you know, something that looks like this. This is our large signal, uh, they say this is our, uh, you know, what is this, V, uh, V, B, E, and this is your current, right? The large signal behavior is very non-linear, okay? And the non-linear behavior is kind of hard to capture in our equations, because you will have to write all the equations exactly, the non-linear ex expressions like exponentials or squares and all those things, right? So instead, what do we do? is we bias the device in certain place. Let's say we bias it in this location, on this characteristic. And then what do we do? We calculate the slope over here, okay? And then we say that, okay, now I'm gonna make approximations. I'm gonna say now for small signal region, I'm only going to have uh, this as my transfer characteristics. So this small signal model will be valid only in that region, okay? Where the input signal is very small and the output is also very small. But as soon as you start applying large signal, this will not be valid. Now why do we do that? First of all, easy hand analysis, quick hand analysis to figure out what's going on. The second one is when you do simulations also, it will become a lot faster. Okay, all right. Any other questions? Okay. So um, this was the story when we went into forward active region. The next part is, uh, which is, you know, also you have to deal with is called something called saturation mode. So in the saturation mode, if you remember, what was the status of uh, base to collector junction? Huh? So both the diodes are forward biased, okay? And uh, we just have to know what happens in that condition because your device can get into that situation. It's maybe not desirable all the time, but maybe desirable sometimes. So in this particular case, both diodes, which are base to emitter and base to collector, are forward bias. Okay. 
Okay, so if a junction is forward biased, then we can say that VBC has to be greater than 0.4 volts. Because below 0.4 volts, it's still, um, you know, the diode has really not started conducting. Okay, so we can say for sake of discussion that, okay, the VBC has to be greater than 0.4 volts. So in that case, uh, the model looks like this. So if you look at the, actually I like to draw it this way, and then it will become clearer. So this is our, uh, okay, I have one minute. Collector, base, emitter, N plus, P, and N minus. Okay, so this junction we know has to be something like this. So what's the potential difference between this? It's going to be approximately, if it's forward biased, 0.7 volts, right? We use, we can say 0.7 volts. And now we have base to collector junction, that's also forward biased. And there we are saying, so collector junction would look like, collector potential would be somewhere here. So we are saying that, okay, this is at least 0.4 volts. Okay, so this is base potential. And this is your emitter. So then what is my collector to emitter potential? 0.3 plus minus. So whenever VC is close to 0.3, we say that the transistor is getting into saturation. Okay, and if it goes even below that, which means both the diodes are heavily forward biased, okay, then we call it deep saturation. All right. So uh, VCE 0.3 entering in saturation and 0.2 deep sat. Is this part clear? Should I repeat it? Yes? Repeat this one? Okay. So the base to emitter, is that part clear? So this is the base to emitter I'm showing in magenta. I'm just showing the forward bias, which is 0.7 volts. Okay. Now what I'm saying is that the collector part is, base to collector is being forward biased which means base is positive compared to collector, okay? And what we said is um, you have to be at least 0.4 volts because the, still that point the collector, the current still not is, even though it's forward biased, the current is still not flowing. So then I said, okay, it has to be at least 0.4 volts. So I'm just kind of drawing like a diagram to show what is my, this is my collector potential voltage. This one will be the collector voltage because it's below base, it's about 0.4 volts below. So then we can easily figure out what's a collector to emitter potential, okay, which is right here. This is a collector to emitter potential. Just like by level diagram, you can tell. And I think for me, it's easy to understand it this way rather than just remembering the voltages, okay. So this kind of puts everything uh, in perspective showing that both the base emitter and base collector, both junctions are forward biased. Okay, and collector to emitter voltage is also coming out here, which is 0.3. Below 0.3, it's in saturation. You know, you can, that's all we are trying to say. Okay, now the model looks um, like this, and that's where we will stop. So, saturation model. So this is our original model, which is IS uh, e to exponential uh, VBE by VT. This was our forward active model, right? And this was our emitter and base and uh, collector, okay? So we had IV flowing here and this is our IE, okay? So we make one addition to this picture and what is that addition? the forward biased base to collector diode. And that you can show it right here. I'll show using a different color. Okay. Like this. And that would be your I saturation um, or collector to um, 
current which is depending on VBC divided by VT. Okay. So note um, this current, the base to collector current is dependent on VBC, not VBE anymore. Okay. So this just looks like a diode adder on top of it. Now um, the final point is the following which is what is the collector current IC is going to be? IS exponential VBE divided by VT minus hmm, the ISC exponential VBC divided by VT. Okay, just a Kirchhoff's uh, current law at this node. So you have this current flowing down and you have current flow from uh, the ISC current flowing from here. Okay, and then the base current is similarly going to be equal to um, IS divided by beta exponential um, VBE by VT. Would this current get divided by beta for base? It won't. The reason is it's physically connected over here, right? This was the beta divided by beta current and this is the actual current. So then this would look like this, ISC exponential VBC divided by VT. Okay. So the final point is the beta for saturation is given by IC divided by IB and it's less than beta active region because we have all these components here. Okay, and we'll stop right here.